With this lecture, we're going to start a discussion that's going to stay with us for much of the rest of the course. The subject, to be blunt, is barbarians. Now, barbarians is a term that um, I'm on some level almost as uncomfortable with using as I am using the term pagan. Barbarian simply represents a group of people who are demarcated as different from either Greeks or Romans. And this is a term that's used almost always as a kind of prejudicial term. Um, the history of the concept is not a very good one. It's basically a word that's used to denote people who are outside of the plane of civilized society by people in antiquity. And the classic description of barbarians is something that we find in Ammianus. And it actually reveals a huge amount about the Roman attitude towards barbarians. And it also, not coincidentally, shows some of the problems with the use of the term barbarian that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. So Ammianus describes, um, in this passage he's describing the Huns, who are in many ways the sort of super barbarians, the most barbaric of barbarians in the eyes of people in the later Roman Empire. And so Ammianus begins by saying that the people of the Huns are quite abnormally savage. From the moment of their birth, they make deep gashes in their children's cheeks, so that when in due course hair appears, its growth is checked by the wrinkled scars as they grow older, and this gives them the unlovely appearance of beardless eunuchs. He goes on to say their shape is human, but their way of life is so rough that they don't actually have any use for fire or seasoned food, but they live on the roots of wild plants and the half raw flesh of any sort of animal which they warm a little by placing it between their thighs and the backs of their horses. And this is sort of the, my favorite part of this. They wear garments of linen or of the skins of field mice stitched together, and once they've put their necks into some dingy shirt, they never take it off or change it until it rots and falls to pieces. Now, of course, the Huns are a special case. They are the most barbaric of all barbarians, but Ammianus doesn't really have good things to say about many other barbarians either. So he describes the Agathisri as men who dye their hair blue and behave in an uncivilized fashion. He said that the Alans live in bark tents and forage for food like wild animals. And so what you see in Ammianus is a literary representation of barbarians as basically subhuman. And this particular quote is a perfect example of this prejudice. It's not possible for the Huns to live the way Ammianus talks about them. They don't wear clothes stitched of field mice skin. If you stop for a minute and think about that, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you could never even catch enough field mice let alone skin them and sew it together to make a shirt. And if you did make a shirt, would you really only have one and wear it until it rots and falls to pieces? This is just, this is just not at all how regular people live. But that's the point. Barbarians, in the telling of people like Ammianus, are subhuman. They just don't actually rise above, as Ammianus says here. Uh, they have a human shape, but they don't really rise above the level of animals. Uh, this is why they don't warm their food. This is why they cook their food by putting it between their legs. This is the sign of a subhuman existence, and that's how authors see barbarians in this period. But we have to also remember Ammianus's audience. Ammianus is performing this. This is circulating amongst the senatorial elite in the city of Rome in the 380s. Had they ever seen a Hun? Maybe. But they hadn't seen many of them. And so they're reading this for entertainment. They're not reading this for anthropological or sociological truth. And so when Ammianus is talking about this, he is building on an established prejudice of what barbarians are like, and he's adding color so that his description is memorable. And it succeeds. This is one of the most memorable descriptions of barbarians we see. But memorable doesn't mean true. Because the relationships that Romans actually had with barbarians reflects a much more nuanced and complicated relationship that's a lot more mutual than it is uh, the sort of thing Ammianus suggests. It's not humans interacting with people who are effectively animals. It's humans interacting with other people. Uh, and when you look at the frontier, 
This is something that immediately becomes clear if we look at the frontier in the right way. So when we look at the frontier in this map, what we see is something that um, is a firm and established line, right? It's a red line. The Roman frontier is a red line that separates Rome from what's not Rome. Um, this is one way to think about a boundary, right? Boundaries are bordered by walls. And here's Hadrian's Wall, of course, the most famous boundary in the Roman Empire, the wall that ran across separating Scotland from the Roman territory of Britain. Um, and when we think of a wall, of course, we think about this as an impermeable boundary. But the reality, as we know in San Diego, is that a wall is not designed to be impermeable. What a wall is designed to do is to symbolize division and also create channels where people can pass from one side to the other. And so here at Hadrian's Wall, you see it's a wall, but there's also a fort and a gateway and you can pass through the wall if you need to. And so the wall is a way of managing the boundary. And managing the boundary is the concept that we have to really keep in mind when we think about the Roman frontier. Because we are tempted, we are always tempted, to see this firm line between the civilized Romans and the people in field mice skins who live in this subhuman existence. But that reality is not the reality that we have. Um, instead, what we have is a boundary zone, a kind of frontier zone, like we have in San Diego, where it's possible and easy under most circumstances to pass between the United States and Mexico. But you only do it in certain places. And those places are monitored, but there's also efforts to capitalize on the fact that those are the places where you cross. So if you think, for example, about um, the outlet malls just across the border from Tijuana, that is very deliberately placed. Those outlet malls are there because it facilitates easy access by people coming across the border. That's very much deliberate. And that's what a frontier zone is like. Um, in the same way that there are Americans who cross the border at Ote Mesa or at San Isidro so that they can get medical care or dental care in Mexico, and there are Mexicans who cross the border so that they can do shopping in um, San Diego, this is the same kind of phenomenon that we would see along a Roman frontier. Um, now, if the frontier was, if there was a violent incursion across the frontier, well, that was different. And the Romans had a capacity to deal with this. Now, in the early empire, the frontier was patrolled overwhelmingly by military forces that were stationed right along the frontier, as in the forts that lined Hadrian's Wall. But as you move into the later imperial period, there's a different kind of strategy that develops under Diocletian and Constantine, where there are large imperial field armies that are pulled back somewhat from the border. Now, the border is still patrolled. It's still guarded. Um, but the large concentration of forces are there to respond to any incursion that immediately crosses the border. And this is a change from the first and second century strategy, where generally the borders were supposed to hold. And if someone broke through, uh, it would take a little bit of time to mobilize a large enough field army to confront them. In the third and early fourth century, with the reforms of Diocletian and Constantine, those large armies stayed back in centers like Trier. And so if there was a breach along the Rhine frontier, they could, in a sense, intercept them um, and do it in such a way where if they barbarian attackers managed to cross the frontier, they could be sure to meet an overwhelming Roman military response before they got deep into Roman territory. But there was another strategy too that we see uh, active in this period. Um, and so here you see the northwest frontier, you see um, Treveri, you see Colonia Agripensis, Colonia Agripensis is Cologne, Treveri is Trier. Um, these are centers where you do have concentrations of troops that can respond to any kind of incursion across the border. And you can see why Trier would be a good place to do this. Um, there is lots of space for you to move from Trier and intercept anyone coming across the Rhine frontier before they get into the richer cities of southern Gaul or northern Italy. But the second part of the strategy was not just responding if barbarian invaders cross the frontier. Another part of the strategy in the third century was, in the fourth century, was crossing the frontier and taking the war to the barbarians. 
And this was done on a semi-regular basis, you know, maybe once a generation or so, just so that the barbarians understood what it was like to fight the Romans. Um, this was a way to make barbarians in their own territory respect Roman military power so that they wouldn't be tempted to breach the frontier and go on raids into Roman territory. Now, barbarians came to respect this Roman military power, but we have to again be more nuanced in how we understand what's going on in this area. Because the Roman military also includes barbarian recruits. There are Batavians and heralds and others who serve as auxiliaries in the Roman army, meaning they fight in a traditional um, way consistent with their traditional um, tactics. Uh, but then there are also regular individual barbarian soldiers who serve in the Roman army as well. And so even this dichotomy or this binary between Roman soldier and barbarian is something that is beginning to break down in the fourth century. These things are more complicated. And just as important as the complexity of Roman military relationships and the complexity of uh, this sort of idea of a frontier zone is the spread of Roman things into barbaricum, into this land that barbarians control. Um, because we can talk about barbarian presence and barbarian influence on regions of the Roman territory that come near to the frontier, but it's also true that in regions controlled by barbarians that abut the Roman frontier, you have a considerable amount of Roman influence as well. Uh, and one of the most important influences we see in the fourth century is a religious influence coming from the Romans. So. Uh, in the middle part of the fourth century, we see the Roman state, which has just recently seen its emperors convert to Christianity, begin an effort to convert the Goths, the main barbarian tribe in the Southern Balkans, to Christianity as well. And this starts under the reign of the Emperor Constantius II. Uh, now, Constantius found a wonderful person to do this. It was a man named Ophila. And Ophila was descended from Cappadocian Christians who had been captured in a Gothic raid that had penetrated all the way to Cappadocia, which is a region in what's now Turkey, um, and taken captives and taken them back across the Danube into um, Gothic territory. And Ophila's Christian, Greek-speaking parents were among this group. And Ophila was raised a Christian. Um, and because of this, Ophila was, perhaps because of this, Ophila was selected to go on an embassy from the Goths to the Roman imperial court of Constantius. And while he was there, it became clear that this is someone who both is bilingual, he speaks Gothic and Greek, and he's a Christian. And so while Ophila is in the Roman Empire, he's chosen as the Christian bishop for the Goths, and he's given the task of converting the Goths to Christianity. And part of the task that he's given is to come up with a Gothic alphabet, because Gothic at this point was not written in an alphabetic script. Um, and then he was to translate the Bible into Gothic using this new Gothic alphabet. Now this is a page of a Bible written in Gothic. It's actually a very famous document that now is in um, Uppsala in Sweden. And it's written, in pur it's written on purple parchment, or um, purple, um, purple writing, <laughs> writing material, uh, and it therefore probably belonged to a Gothic king. Now, the uh, script of this, you can see it's a Gothic script, um, and Gothic is a form of German. But if you look at this, what you see are letters that look like Greek letters, especially gammas, psi, uh, letters that you don't see in the Latin alphabet, lambdas. This is because Ophila, of course, made his Gothic alphabet, an alphabet that actually reflects German or a proto-German language, and he did it based on the alphabet he was most familiar with, the Greek alphabet. And so this is a bit of an interesting um, conceptual switch for us. We're told that when Ophila uh, finished this task, he translated into the scriptures, he translated all of the scriptures into Gothic, with the exception of the Book of Kings. And this is because the Book of Kings contained the history of wars, while the Gothic people, who are lovers of war, were in need of something to restrain their passion for fighting rather than incite them to it. 
And so they got the rest of the Bible, not the book of Kings. Now we're told that the religious conversion process goes in fits and starts. Aphila returns to Gothic territory around 341. Um, his work goes reasonably well, but he's expelled from Gothic territory in 348 when the Romans and Goths begin fighting. But all the same, his efforts did seem to succeed, and by the end of the 4th century, it seems many Goths had been converted to Christianity. But, of course, and this is important for us to keep in mind, the Emperor Constantius was an Arian Christian, and Ufila was therefore converting the Goths to Arian Christianity. And as the Roman Empire, after Constantius, begins to turn away from Arian Christianity, this creates a tension between the religion of the Goths and the religion of the Romans, a tension that is not altogether um, unwelcome by Gothic kings who like to enjoy some of the fruits of a close connection to Rome and Roman culture and Roman technology uh, and Roman religious ideas, but also like to differentiate themselves somewhat. Uh, the religious relationships are important because they also build on really deep commercial, intellectual, and cultural ties that span across this barbarian region and this border region. And so here you see some examples of gold artifacts found in a Gothic tomb in Romania. And you can see the quality of the gold work here. Um, this is not made by people wearing field mice skin. This is made by people who live in a frontier zone who have access to the skilled metal workings uh, done in the Roman Empire. And they also have the ability to imitate some of these things. Now this is a particularly good indication of the fact that you have this frontier zone. Um, on the left, you have a coin of the Emperor Constantius II. On the right, you have a barbarian imitation of that coin. And you can see the portraiture kind of matches. You can see some of the letters kind of match. So if you look at uh, the reverse of the coin, um, on the Roman version of it, you have an emperor holding a phoenix on a ship with a victory. And the, the legend says, fell temp reparatio. The barbarian side of this, you can kind of still make out the emperor, you can kind of make out the phoenix he's holding, you can kind of make out the wings of the victory, you can still see the ship, and you can see the I.O. in the legend. Now, what you can see from this are a couple of really important points. First of all, this Roman coinage obviously is circulating in barbarian territory. Second of all, they have more need for that coinage than they have supply. And so this barbarian coinage is not somebody forging Roman coins so that they can maybe pass them in the Roman Empire. That won't work. Everybody in Rome will immediately look at this and realize this is not a Roman coin. And so this isn't designed to circulate in Rome. It's instead designed to circulate in this frontier zone on the barbarian side of the border. And this is because Gothic or whoever it is, um, whatever barbarian made this coin, they need Roman coins. They use Roman coins. And the supply of Roman coins in their area is insufficient to meet the needs. And so they make their own. This shows a deep kind of integration, a cultural interaction, an economic interaction, um, and a sophistication that completely belies the idea that barbarians are these backwards animal types. Um, and we have other texts that tell us how this could happen. Uh, we hear, for example, about kings on the other side of the Roman frontier giving permission for Romans to come across the border and trade with them. Um, and we hear Romans granting the same permissions to people from barbarian, from the barbarian side. The other thing that we have to understand, and this is a little less uh, comforting to us, is as both groups raid across the border, they carry people back with them. And so barbarians who attack across the Roman frontier capture Romans and bring them back as slaves to live in Gothic territory. And Romans who raid across the Gothic frontier or barbarian frontiers, they capture people and bring them back into Roman territory as slaves. And so there is a lot of even movement of people across these frontier regions. 
barbarian groups are separated by a boundary from the Romans, but the boundary is very permeable. Um, and it's permeable in such a way that there is a lot of communication, a lot of interaction, and a lot of trade and exchange across the border. So this gives us a setting for things as we move to the later fourth century. But to understand the sort of signal changes of the 370s, the things that fundamentally break down the balance that has more or less held in these regions for almost 400 years, we have to return back into Roman history, back into the affairs of the empire, and particularly back to the affairs of the empire after the death of the Emperor Julian. So the Emperor Julian dies in the year 363. Um, he dies while on campaign in Persia, while trying to lead his armies back across the Roman frontier. And uh, he dies before he succeeded in doing this. And so because the army is in enemy territory, they are being harassed by the Persians at that moment, the army holds a council um, and they select someone from their officer corps, a man named Jovian, to basically superintend the rest of the campaign and try to get the Roman army safely out of Persia. And Jovian makes a peace agreement with the Persians, um, in which Jovian gives up a significant amount of Roman territory in Mesopotamia and in the mountains of what's now Armenia. Uh, and in return, the Roman army is allowed to peacefully leave Persian territory without any further attacks by the Persian troops. Uh, now, this is a strategic um, defeat for the Romans. It's a really significant amount of things they give up. Now the territory they give up would be the equivalent of, um, it moves the frontier about a hundred miles back into Roman territory. And that sounds like a lot. I mean that would be like the equivalent of um, the United States ceding everything south of LA to Mexico. I mean, it's a big amount of territory, but what's particularly important is Jovian also gives up the strategic city of Nisibis. And the city of Nisibis is really the key to this peace agreement because there's basically um, one main way that Romans and Persians invade each other's territory. And it's through the uh, area between the Tigris and the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. And across the course of the fourth century, the cities in these regions have become increasingly well fortified. And Nisibis was incredibly well fortified. Um, we hear from a man named Ephraim, who was a resident of Nisibis, that across the fourth century, there were a number of battles fought by the Persians outside of Nisibis. Um, one involving you know, massive attacks by elephants and art artillery. Another one, the Persians flooded the entire area around Nisibis and actually used ships to try to attack the city, Nisibis fought back and fought off all of these attacks uh, until 363, when Jovian gives the city up peacefully. Now, it's such a blow that the terms of the peace treaty say that the Romans are actually supposed to get Nisibis back in 120 years. Now, of course, no one is going to be alive in 120 years, and so this is a concession that seems meaningless. None of the people making this deal will get Nisibis back. None of the people in Persia um, who arranged this will have to give Nisibis back. It's a completely theoretical idea that the Persians have Nisibis kind of on a 120-year lease. Uh, in the same way the U.S. has Guantanamo Bay, right? I mean, this is, in theory, something that we lease from the Cubans. In practice, the Cubans are not going to get it back unless we decide to give it to them. Uh, the same is true of the Persians and Nisibis. And everybody knew this. Um, and so to give this up is a major blow. And Jovian has to work really hard to try to sell this peace treaty to people. Uh, but Jovian doesn't actually live long enough to even get to Constantinople to try to sell the peace treaty to the larger Roman Empire. On his way back from Persia, Jovian spends the night in a village outside of what's now Ankara, uh, and the villagers were so excited about Jovian coming that they freshly painted the room in the house where he was staying and freshly plastered it. And Jovian died overnight of paint fumes. Uh, he's poisoned. And so the Romans now have to choose yet another new emperor. And we have to remember, this is now the beginning of 364. So between 363, when Constantius II died, and now, uh, February of 364, Rome has already blown through uh, two emperors and now has to pick a third in the better part of three years. Uh, and so the uh, troops do what they did before. They have a council. 
And at the council, they propose some names. They even offer the position to somebody, and that person turns them down. And so ultimately, they turn to the most, um, the nearest person with military experience and the sort of character to maybe bring the empire together. This is a man named Valentinian. And the great advantage that Valentinian had was he was nearby. And he was a sort of forceful figure. And so he is chosen as emperor after um, people have turned it down. And after the people in this council realized we need to have somebody do this job when this guy's as good as anybody else. But almost immediately after Valentinian is announced to his troops, the troops uh, demand that he appoints a colleague because they are absolutely terrified of a situation like that of Julian or Jovian, where there's one person in charge and he ends up dying. Uh, and so Valentinian assents to this, and Valentinian is um, Valentinian chooses his brother Valens as his co-emperor. They spend a little bit of 364 together, uh, they go to Constantinople, and uh, then they split. And Valens has control of the Roman East, Valentinian takes control of the Roman West, and they never see each other again. Now they have two different fates and two different profiles in the sources. Uh, Valentinian is, generally speaking, a successful emperor. He's seen as such by contemporaries, but subsequent generations and centuries will raise his profile dramatically. So to people in the 4th century, he's generally a successful emperor with some warts. Um, to people in subsequent centuries, he gets elevated to uh, the highest levels of imperial achievement. And this is because Valentinian took on two tasks. The first task was to patrol and control the Rhine frontier. Uh, and this is something that he felt was particularly important. Uh, and in the ideas of people along the Rhine, this was a job an emperor needed to do. But it was a job that, say, Julian, for example, had done very well about 10 years before. Um, before that, Constantius I had done a pretty good job. Even before that, the Gallic Empire had done a good job. Patrolling the Rhine was something that emperors were thought to be able to do. What nobody knew at the time is Valentinian would be the last emperor to effectively control that border. Um, and so this is why his military achievements look so much better in retrospect. Another thing that Valentinian took on was a campaign to try to correct corruption and abuse in the Roman administrative system. And here his efforts are a little more mixed. Um, Ammianus, in talking about Valentinian, said that he really had the best intentions. If he'd regulated the rest of his conduct by the same standard that he brought to regulating affairs in the empire, he would have been thought like that of Trajan or Marcus Aurelius. Again, these are both figures that Ammianus has talked about earlier in the book in, chap in books that we have now lost. Um, and so it's clear what he's talking about here. Trajan is a great military general. Um, Marcus Aurelius is, of course, the philosophical emperor and the uh, ideal for contemplative and measured ways of, me of ruling the empire. And generally speaking, a lot, Amiana says, a lot of what Valentinian did worked. He kept a tight rein on the uh, wantonness of the imperial court. He was very careful in making appointments to high positions. And in his reign, no one engaged in finance, governed a province, and no office was put up for sale, except in the early days when this is unavoidable because the emperor is too busy to punish people doing this. And so these are praises of Valentinian. What Ammianus is saying is he is good-minded, um, he's honest, uh, he has a particular control for the fair and just functioning of the Roman state, and he really, really genuinely wants to do things to improve these standards. Uh, and Ammianus says, you know, in the main, um, he succeeds in this. But at the same time, um, Valentinian sometimes, Ammianus says, let his temper get the better of him. And this is what Ammianus means when he says if he'd regulated his conduct by the same standard, his life would have been like that of Trajan or Marcus Aurelius. He's 95% Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, but he is very, in Ammianus' is telling, prone to anger. And this sometimes undoes his ability to live up to these standards.
So one case where you can see uh, this particular challenge and Valentinian's failure to rise to it is a set of events that occur in the African province of Tripolis. Uh, and this is a set of events that center on the city of Lepsis Magna, the old uh, hometown of the Emperor Septimius Severus. Now, in Lepsis, a member of a semi-barbaric tribe from the, the sort of frontier, the place where Roman um, urban and agricultural life merges or blends into the Sahara Desert. Somebody from the closer to the Sahara side of this uh, was convicted of a crime in the city of Lepsis and was hung. His countrymen then attacked the city in which he was executed, and the Roman citizens of the province then call upon the military governor of Africa to provide troops. And he shows up. This is what's supposed to happen. So far, the system is working just like it's supposed to. But when the governor arrives with his troops and he was asked to help the town out of its distress, he replies that he would not take the field against these um, people coming from the desert unless he was furnished with abundant supplies and 4,000 camels. And the citizens were stunned by this answer. And they declared that after all that they had suffered from burning and looting, they could not meet this demand. Now, it is permissible for a military commander showing up in a city to demand supplies. Um, in a pre-modern society, this is absolutely necessary. You don't know what they have. You don't actually know what the situation is on the ground. And you don't know where your soldiers might need to stay. And so if the army does show up in your town, you're expected to house soldiers in your houses and provide them with food and provide them with material they need to defend you. But it's clear that this military governor is asking for way more than he actually needs to fight this battle. Um, 4,000 camels is a ridiculous number, and it's clear what he's doing is extorting these citizens. And so the people said that they couldn't pay, uh, and then the count did something that was not acceptable. He just left. Uh, and so the military commander left, and the people of Lepsis then petitioned the emperor. We saw all the way back when we were talking about the Emperor Augustus and Tacitus's description of how the provincials approved of Augustus, how this idea that you can petition the Emperor for redress when officials serving in the Emperor's um, name are ineffective. And so the people of Lepsis at the next meeting of the provincial assembly resolved to send two notable people, Severus and Flaccus, as envoys to Valentinian. And they're to greet him on his accession and give him gold statuettes of the goddess Victory and then tell him the lamentable condition of the province. And this trip is important because these envoys are supposed to go as part of the general um, activity that provinces undertake and greet the new emperor, give him a gift celebrating his accession, uh, and then uh, introduce him to the conditions in their province. And so again, what they're doing is completely typical and acceptable. It's actually encouraged. It's how the system is supposed to work. But the military governor knew that this was happening. He heard that the provincial assembly had met, that they had agreed to intervene on behalf of the city of Lepsis, and the governor then sent his own person. Um, and so when the envoys reached the court, they had an audience with the emperor and they made a report of their suffering, supported by an official document laying out the course of the affair. The emperor re read it, but he refused to give credence to either that report um, or that that came from the master of offices, who seek to put Romano, Romanos, the uh, military governor's misconduct in a favorable light. And so Valentinian, not knowing what to do, promised the full inquiry, which however was put off as things often are, when advantage is taken of the emperor being occupied by more important business. And so what happened is Valentinian was genuinely interested. He heard about what went on in Lepsis. It concerned him. Uh, but he also had a, a contradictory report from the military governor, from Romanus. And he didn't know what to make of this, so he ordered that someone go and investigate. And this was first put off. Um, eventually, as the town people waited and nothing happened, the uh, people, the barbarians from the desert, attacked Lepsis again. 
this time much more severely. And so they sent another embassy to Valentinian. Um, and this time Valentinian said, okay, now I've heard this twice. I'm going to send an official to Africa to try to figure this out. But in the interest of efficiency, the official that he sent to Africa to investigate was also sent on the same ship as the newly minted coins that were to pay the troops stationed in North Africa. And so when this official showed up, the military governor allowed him to pocket some of the money that was supposed to go to pay the army. And uh, then the envoy went to Lepsis and went back to Valentinian and said, you know what? Uh, no, those people are lying. The uh, military governor is doing, Romanus is doing everything he's supposed to. And these people are just filing a false report. And so when news reached Valentinian about the people's complaints being false, Valentinian, who was prone to harshness, decreed that Jovinus, as the prime mover, with Calistinus, Concordius, and Lucius as partners in the fraud, should suffer capital punishment. And they did. Uh, these were the envoys from the province who had said, "We, our cities are still being attacked, the military governor is doing nothing. Um, and when Valentinian heard that this was false, um, because his person sent to investigate had been paid off by Romanus, Valentinian got angry. And this, Ammianus says, is Valentinian's central fault. He would get angry. And so Valentinian got angry and he ordered these envoys executed uh, because Valentinian could not control his anger. And it's that that makes it so that Valentinian does not rise to the level of the absolute sort of pantheon of super successful emperors. Because in this case, and in other cases, Valentinian gets angry. And that anger is something um, that has consequences that undermine his commitment to justice. Now, eventually, Ammianus said, this case unraveled only when a letter was found that implicated Romanus in the original attempt at extortion, and it indicated the truth of the story of the townspeople. And those who collaborated with Romanus were finally punished nearly 15 years later after everybody um, the townspeople who had come as envoys and even Valentinian had died. So what we see here is a Roman legal procedure that Valentinian is absolutely committed to. There is a recourse for people who are dealing with corrupt officials. The complaints are taken seriously. They are investigated, but at the same time, there is still the possibility of the investigation being corrupted. And that's what happened here. The process worked as it was supposed to. Romanus was just so corrupt that he managed to corrupt the entire process, and innocent people died as a result. At the same time, though, we see that this is consistent with Valentinian's general approach towards justice. Um, so, for example, there are a number of trials in the city of Rome related to sorcery, but they're actually trials. Valentinian is very interested in having people who are possibly breaking the law about the use of magic tried for that crime. But if they are found not guilty, Valentinian respects that. It is a genuine trial. And many of the people charged were actually found not guilty. So Valentinian is operating according to a system of law and a system of justice, a system that can be corrupted, but a system whose integrity he very much respects and whose decisions he very much respects. The same can't be said for Valens. Valens was a much weaker and somewhat paranoid sovereign, uh, and he had been um, immediately, almost upon accession, forced to deal with the revolt of a cousin of the Emperor Julian, and he never really recovered his bearings. He remained a very suspicious figure, um, and he was also less able to manage the nuances of administration than his brother. And so, whereas Valentinian in the magic trials in Rome was very interested in being sure that the process that investigated these charges of magic was a fair one and was respectful of decisions where people who were found not guilty um, were not to be punished because they had been tried, Valens worked differently. Um, Valens was much more subject to being swayed by informers who pointed out to him people who were conspiring against him. He was less interested in investigating these charges and more interested in acting on them. And so Ammianus says of this, anyone whom the informer, who was free from all legal restraint, had the assurance to assert ought to be sent for, was sent for, 
even from the furthest corners of the empire. And the emperor ordered a trial on a criminal, mo criminal charge to be set in motion, but for a long time, justice was tightly bound and trampled underfoot because Valens didn't always respect those trials. They weren't always fair trials. Um, now, as long as Valentinian was alive, some of the worst aspects of Valens' personality were held in check. But Valentinian died in the year 375. And following this, his son Gratian was chosen as Emperor of the West. Now, Gratian was a young man, about 20 years old when he took over. He was not Valentinian. Uh, he was not a military figure. And he had come to distrust a lot of the people who had formed the core of Valentinian's group of advisors. And so within a year of taking power, Gratian had deposed a lot of those people, killed some of them, and reconstructed the court around people that he actually respected and uh, who shared his outlook. And his outlook was much more that of a senatorial figure and a cultured figure than Valentinian, who inclined towards the military and uh, respected the sorts of advice that he got from military figures. And so unlike Valentinian, he did not have the same level of respect from the military. And this is unfortunate, because not long after Valentinian's death, Valens who was constitutionally um, incapable of making good decisions about things on occasion, and Gratian, who was young and didn't have the right sort of experience, were confronted with a really significant crisis. Um, this is a crisis that was sparked by a series of migrations and military changes that stretched all the way from Central Asia to the Roman frontier. And at the center of this was a movement by the Huns westward from the um, areas of Central Asia all the way basically to the people who made up and lived in this frontier zone along the Roman frontier. Um, and the most important people who were pressed on by the Huns were the Goths. And so the Goths who in former times inhabited the region beyond the Eister all the way down to the Danube and were masters of other barbarians were driven from their lands by the people called the Huns and crossed over into Roman territory. Now the Huns first tried the strength of the Goths with a small force of men and later attacked in full force, defeated the Goths in battle and took possession of their entire country. <laughs> The challenge the Goths had was that they were now fenced in between two really powerful adversaries. The Huns had defeated them and had basically established a tributary empire requiring the Goths who still remained in their homeland to pay large tributes to the Huns. Um, but the Huns, I mean, the Goths couldn't easily ex escape the Huns because to their south and to their west was the Roman Empire. And so the Goths really didn't have much of a choice. Um, they didn't want to live under the Huns, but they didn't really have the ability to go anywhere else either. And so what the Goths tried to do uh, was present or ask for asylum in Roman territory, and they appealed to the Emperor Valens for this asylum. And Valens made an agreement that uh, on, first ga on first glance looks to make a lot of sense. Again, as we talk about this frontier region, the Goths along this frontier region were familiar with aspects of Roman life. Many of them had spent time in Roman territory. Uh, they had fought alongside Romans in the Roman army. And what Valens did was something that Romans had done for a long time. The land in this frontier area was relatively empty. And so Valens agreed to let the Goths migrate and come across the Roman frontier and settle in land. Uh, that had been relatively undercultivated in areas like Serbia and Bulgaria. But Valens set some conditions for this. Uh, what was supposed to happen was the Goths were supposed to cross at selected points, they were supposed to cross in small groups, and then once they crossed into Roman territory they were supposed to be dispersed so that Gothic populations would come in, mingle with Roman populations, and eventually become integrated into the state. And it was supposed to be a controlled process. And it seems from everything that we can tell that the Romans didn't expect this to be a random process either. They expected people to cross at specific places, and they did their best to be sure that when those people crossed, they could be settled. But the reality was far different. 
Um, instead of crossing at selected points and settling in small groups that were widely dispersed, the Goths crossed in large groups. These are people who are terrified of the Huns. And so large numbers of Goths start crossing, not the small numbers the Romans expected. And so the Romans are not able to channel them um, to the appropriate places. They're not able to uh, make sure that there's sufficient supplies because there's more people than they expected. And a second group of Goths that it doesn't seem had permission to cross, then cross in the wake of this first group. Now, um, Goth, Gothic political life was organized around confederations that's, that lived under the control of a king. But this is a sort of loose designation. The king is not a hereditary monarchy. It's a person who's able to build together a coalition of people willing to serve under him. These coalitions can fragment. Um, but this is a way that Goths naturally thought to organize themselves politically. And so when the Goths settle in the Roman Empire, a lot of the confederations that they had um, created on the other side of the frontier more or less remain intact. And this meant that when they cross into Roman territory um, and then they are faced with Romans who are unprepared to deal with the number of Goths who have crossed and are unprepared to deal with Goths crossing and living in these large groups as opposed to these dispersed smaller settlements, uh, the Romans are unable to provide the basic necessities for the Gothic life, uh, for the Goths to live as they want. Um, Ammianus, for example, tells us stories of Roman profiteers selling the Goths rancid dog meat because it's the only food available in the region. And so by 377, um, not even a year more, not even a year has passed since the bulk of these people have migrated, they revolt. They have the political structure still intact to do this, and large numbers of Goths revolt because of their mistreatment. By 378, the Emperor Valens had mobilized a large army that was to attack the forces of the Goths. Um, he was supposed to uh, link up with a force that Gratian was bringing from the west, and the two forces together were supposed to attack the Goths. But when Gratian is a little more than a week away, uh, Valens hears and sends out a reconnaissance team that tells him that at that moment the forces of the Goths are actually relatively small. Now, Valens's troops are about eight miles away from the Gothic lines at this point, um, and this is August 9th of 378 uh, in a hot and dry Thracian um, terrain uh, and the Romans are forced to put on their armor and Valens decides that he doesn't want to wait for Gratian. He wants to have the victory all to himself and so he has his troops march eight miles from where they were camped to the Gothic lines. <laughs> And it's rough country. And then by the time they get there, it's midday. And the troops, when they come inside, come within sight of the enemy wagons, uh, they see that the wagons are drawn up in a full circle. Now, before the armies met, the Goths realized that their cavalry is not back yet, and they want to delay the battle. And so the Goths send envoys. Now, the goal of the Gothic envoys is to try to delay the battle so the cavalry can come back, and also to ensure that the Roman men who are standing there in their armor without sufficient supplies of water and are sweating and are melting in the heat, they should be parched with thirst. Uh, and then, to make things worse, um, the false negotiation ends and the Goths then light fires to make it hotter and more difficult for the Romans to breathe. Then they join battle. And when they join battle, the Gothic, uh, the Gothic infantry is arranged around this circular structure of wagons. So it's a well-supported um, area. And when the Romans come up in lines, it's difficult for them to fight against this circle. They have to go and envelop the circle. And so as they start to do this, the Gothic cavalry comes up behind the circles and goes around both sides, outflanking the Romans, pushing back the Roman cavalry, and then the circle breaks. And when the circle breaks, they envelop the Roman infantry. And what Ammianus describes is something that is absolutely horrible, absolutely terrifying. The Romans collapse in on themselves. 
Now the whole reason the Romans are so successful militarily is because this infantry is extremely well prepared. It's a professional force. It knows how to fight. They don't freak out. They don't lose their nerve. But in this situation, in this scene of total confusion, the infantry, worn out by toil and danger, had no strength nor sense left to form a plan. And as they get crushed in on themselves, the ground gets so drenched in blood that they slip and they fall. Probably the best way to sort of visualize what's going on here um, is to think about the scene of the Battle of the Bastards in Game of Thrones, when Ramsay Bolton envelops the army of Jon Snow and the troops are just on top of each other and they get pressed tighter and tighter and tighter so that they can't even move. The ground then, as these people die, gets so drenched in blood that they can't even get their footing. The entire core of the Roman infantry is annihilated in this fashion. But even worse, Valens, when he sees what's going on, Valens retreats. He flees. He takes refuge in the hut of a farmer. And the Roman defeat is so total that Valens cannot be defended. Instead, the Goths burn him in this hut. The Battle of Adrianople in August of 378 is one of these moments that fundamentally changes the world because it destroys effectively the military power of the Eastern Roman Empire, Eastern Roman army. The field army that Valens commands has incredible amount of human capital and training and background and you cannot, even if you can replace the men, and the empire has easily the capacity to replace these men, it cannot replace these men with seasoned troops who can do what these men could do. Um, and so early in 379, Gratian appoints a man named Theodosius as the new emperor of the East who's supposed to settle the Gothic problem. Theodosius recruits a brand new army. We have a great panegyric delivered by a rhetorician who says, Theodosius is such a wonderful general. He took people who were used to plowing the fields and he trains them to be effective Roman, arm Roman troops. And he did take people who plowed the fields and he brought them into the army and he trained them up. And they lose to the Goths overwhelmingly, so much so that Gratian has to take the command away from him temporarily. Roman troops are not easily replaced. And when this many of them are destroyed, the loss to the empire is really, really significant. It's not so much a loss in quantity. They can replace the troops. They have more than enough people to fill an army. But the quality is not easily replaced. And what this means is that Theodosius, by 382, realizes he does not have the military force to destroy the Goths. Instead, what he does is he comes to a peace agreement with the Goths where he settles them in the lands of the Balkans and comes up with an arrangement where Gothic troops can serve in his Eastern Roman army, reconstituting the Eastern Roman army that they had destroyed in 378. But this is a really significant development because never before in Roman history had a barbarian group come into Roman territory, defeated a Roman emperor, and been allowed to stay. Even the Goths who defeated Decius in the third century left, went back to their territory, uh, they did not stay, and the death of Decius wasn't really avenged, but it wasn't a permanent change in the way the empire worked. The Persians captured the emperor Valerian, they killed the Emperor Valerian, but they were pushed out of Roman territory uh, and didn't actually maintain any kind of presence in Roman territory after that victory. This is different. After the Battle of Adrianople, the Goths kill a Roman Emperor and they are not destroyed because of it. Instead, they are allowed to stay in Roman territory because the Roman state lacked the capacity to destroy them or make them leave. And this is a very significant shift in the way Rome works, a shift that will have long-standing implications for the future.